Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sam. Do you like my shirt today? I picked out a shirt that's um, just as chaotic as my content will be as we again dive into Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings. Now, if you watched the first um, part on the introduction, then you know the video style is going to be a little bit different. Um, there will be a little bit more of a voiceover component. Um, as well as some images of items that I have clipped from sources and from the book itself. So I will have that sort of um, video style happening again this time around. Just wanted to give a little disclaimer there. And if you thought the introduction to this book was as frustrating as I did, well, buckle up, buttercup, because we are in for a bumpy freaking ride. I did a lot of venting about this. <laughs> to my husband, and my frustration is palpable. First, I think I figured out why there are not many ordinary people going through this book. In addition to it being a historical text, which can often be dry, Dr. Strings apparently decided to use her Microsoft Word thesaurus the way Joey did on Friends. Of course it does. It's smart. I used a thesaurus. Throughout the book, she consistently uses words that are just completely unnecessary to make her point. I digress. And just like the introduction of the book, Dr. Strings goes ahead and contradicts her argument right off the bat stating that chapter one will offer a retrospective view of the preference for plump feminine forms. She begins by describing Western aesthetic ideals and showing that key artists and philosophers described plump and proportionate women as beautiful. Following this statement, she says, and I quote, I argue that contact with African women in the rise of the slave trade did not change that. I was immediately confused when I saw this, like literally confused historian meme face. I am trying to understand, I mean, she is a college professor. Is this like one of those true false questions where the professors trick you because they're like, haha, one word was missing. This statement directly contradicts her overarching argument, which is that the rise of fat phobia was created by the rise of the slave trade. So... Here we are, and we're only one page in to the first chapter. She spends much of chapter one going through the history of Renaissance painters, focusing on how they often painted black women as equally voluptuous alongside their European counterparts. This is particularly interesting given that in the introduction of the book, she lets us know that she was using the sociology of Pierre Bordeaux, who theorized that the elites are always trying to distinguish themselves from the, quote, others. If this was true, and this is how she is defining her analysis, why would master painters paint the others as equals? It doesn't quite make sense that you believe the elites are always separating themselves as a social distinction, but then also saying that the others, aka black women, were painted as equals in the paintings. Throughout much of the chapter, Dr. Strings will say things like, a woman might find herself being considered too thin or too fat. Given the prevailing preference for proportionate, often implying medium physiques, but if a lady had to err on one side of the scale, a fat woman was generally preferred to one who might be too thin or too bony. But then she gives no citation. Where the hell did she come up with this? And while I'm talking about citations, her lack of page numbers in her citations this chapter really annoyed me. She'll often cite a source leaving out the volume, the chapter, or the page number, which makes it impossible for anyone to follow the breadcrumb trail that I talked about in the introduction. It's non-existent, and it kind of made me wonder if there's a specific reason that she did it that way. Because it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense in historical writing to leave that out. I would guess when she's making statements like this, she's referring back to her introduction chapter where she tried to say that there was a thinness epidemic, 
but if y'all remember that video that argument did not go particularly well for her so she <laughs> she should probably stop trying to make that happen it's just not going to happen before we move on from chapter one I want to dive into a few of her specific examples now, I'm not an art historian, so please take this with a grain of salt. I just want to point out some of the issues that, in my opinion, seem glaring. First, she spends a lot of time talking about artist Albrecht Dürer and his quest to define beauty. She discusses one of his pieces titled Berlin Study Sheet, where she describes the drawing as showing a row of humanity that shows the prototypical faces of various nations of mankind placing his version of ideal at the forefront of humanity. She states that the final African face with exaggerated features, which some scholars argue is a blend between an African man and an ape, shows that he would put those as the furthest from humanity. If we take a look at this sketch, we can see that it is true that a classical European face is the nearest to us. The face is chiseled and looks like that of the artistic statues that we would see throughout Europe. But the face at the very end is not the only one with exaggerated features. It is unclear to me why she would draw this illustration to make it seem as though Africans were the only people drawn with unusual or exaggerated facial features when we can see right here for ourselves that that is not true. She further discusses Durer's hunt for human perfection and his book, Four Books on Human Proportion, in which he draws, quote, normal male and female forms using mathematical equations like that of the Vitruvian man. She makes a point to note that among his sketches for the book are a disproportionate amount of plump women. Now again, I was a little confused when I read this, because so far she's told us that plump women were preferred so then it would only make sense to me that there would be more of them drawn does that not make sense to anybody else like why say that there was a disproportionate amount of plump women being drawn by this artist but continue to argue that plump women were the thing of the time it doesn't make any sense again it just baffles my brain. She goes as far as to say that maybe plump women were the only ones readily available to serve as models, but then says that is unlikely since he has had a predilection for plump women because even his wife was plump. A quick Google search let me know that Durer did not like his wife and did not have a happy marriage. And all that aside, even when you look at the actual sketches that she included from Durer's book, you can once again see that the plump and proportionate in Durer's time as he was drawing them were medium-sized bodies today. She then transitions to discussing Italian artist Agnolo Ferenzuola. Hope I said that right. Probably freaking butchered it. Sorry about that. Who wrote a book titled The Book of the Courtier. And within this book, he quotes Aristotle stating, if the good habits of the body are evident in the firmness and thickness of the flesh, the bad habits must then be evident in its flabbiness and thinness. Immediately after listing this quote, she summarizes saying that thickness was equal to good health and thinness was related to poor health and hygiene. <laughs> completely skipping over the fact that it also says flabbiness is a bad habit. Like, did she literally have blinders on when she wrote this? Like, I can't imagine continuing to overlook the whole ass context of quotes that I'm pulling out to support my research. It just doesn't make sense. They didn't want people who were thin and they didn't want people who were flabby. They wanted people in the middle. <laughs> but she keeps purposely excluding the flabby bits to just pick on thinness. It's strange to me. Finally, near the end of chapter one, she begins to discuss how black women's portrayals in art changed, i.e. how they were being represented as having low social status compared to their elite sisters. She uses several examples of traditional Venus paintings where Venus is portrayed as a white woman 
who is modestly trying to cover her bare breasts and body. To make her argument, Strings introduces readers to Black Venus, a statue of a woman holding a mirror in one hand and a rag in the other. Strings interprets the statue as follows. She is proportionate and of medium build. She explains that though she is equal in beauty, she is given indicators to represent her low social status, including a simple headdress and a cloth rag. She also claims that African Venus was sculpted to prelude ideas that developed about Africans being immodest and lacking in shame, because instead of trying to cover herself as the white Venus would, she simply gazes at her body in the mirror. Are you all picking up on a trend here? Because you better believe it, she left out some important key points here. What is not mentioned is that the name of the statue is actually African Bather and depicts an African woman in a bathing house. Most interpretations of these statues, because there are more than one of them, share that she is wearing the headdress to protect her hair from the water and carrying a washcloth in her hand. This detail being left off again seems intentional to try to force her argument that even though black women were painted with equally beautiful bodies, they were still seen as lowly. She also says that as the tide started to turn against black women, the plump aesthetic ideal was becoming more and more associated with white women, while in England, men were being lambasted for being fat, as fatness came to mean that men were self-indulgent and dull-minded. Enter chapter two, where once again, right off the bat, I was annoyed at her descriptions of Peter Paul Rubens and his preference for, quote, real women's curves. Again, no citation here saying that this is her interpretation of Peter Paul Rubens and his work. To me, saying real women's curves appears to be Dr. Strings applying today's terminology and descriptions to the past, which is always a no-go. And it just seemed really forced and out of place in a historiography. Throughout this chapter, she aims to pinpoint examples of how black women were being denigrated as lower status, claiming that they were seen as small or low. Here, she uses a snippet from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, in which Hermia is attacked by her friend Helena and her love Lysander. Her friend Helena calling her small and a vixen, her lover Lysander calling her a dwarf, a weed, and an acorn. Dr. Strings goes on to explain Shakespeare made Hermia a vixen capable since a young age of luring men with her sexual charms, as well as a grotesque dwarf causing Lysander to discard her. She then goes on to state, and I'm trying to contain my giggles here, she goes on to state, that Helena, Lysander's newly chosen lover, is described as tall, white, and slim, quote, a painted maypole. Girl, what? Have you read A Midsummer Night's Dream? Maybe you need the Cliff Notes version, I don't know, but let me break down for you all the reasons that this is wrong. <laughs> First of all, she is correct that Hermia is a character of color in this play. What she leaves out is that Hermia is undoubtedly one of the strongest female character voices in this specific plotline. Uh, she openly defies her father, who wants her to marry Demetrius instead of her chosen love, and she's pretty outspoken. Helena is Hermia's friend, but is jealous of the fact that both Lysander and Demetrius are in love with Hermia, which is probably why she referred to her as a vixen while she was insulting her. The four of them end up in an enchanted forest where fairies dust them and a drug-induced chaos ensues. It's supposed to be like a dream state. The fairy dust makes them act out of character and when they get into these arguments, they're purposefully exaggerated and or using incorrect language in the insults to make the audience who's watching the play laugh because this is supposed to be a comedy after all. Anyway, Lysander loves Hermia in real life without the fairy dust, but with the fairy dust, he begins to act out of character. 
He does not choose Helena as a new lover and discard Hermia. That's not what happens. That's what happens when they're under the fairy dust. Additionally, it really made me laugh that she thought that being called a painted maypole was some sort of compliment to Helena because that is actually an insult thrown at her by Hermia, probably because she's tall, skinny, and wearing too much makeup. Have you ever seen a maypole? It's like bright and colorful. Being called a painted maypole to me would be like the equivalent of that a clown face meme where by the end of it, you're in full clown makeup. That's to me what a painted maypole <laughs> would look like. Uh, which would make sense that Helena was trying to be attractive to boys because Hermia had both of them and Helena had none. Cue anger and jealousy. Dr. String's use of this made me crazy. If you're gonna use something as your primary example of a black woman being denigrated in a play, at least try to make it correct. I mean, literally everyone has read this play in middle school. Literally everyone. All right, I digress. <laughs> the other point of chapter two was to discuss the fact that fat was finally being seen as a negative when it came to men. And get this, Strings actually states that the influx of sugar into England saw waistlines growing in ways that brought about new medical maladies. She spends a lot of pages talking about gout and how gout was created by the sugar intake of the English. I read these pages and my brain immediately was like, okay, so you agree. Fat causes medical issues. She goes on to explain that fat men were thought to be dull-minded or of poor constitution by learned men, aka philosophers. Now, why would that be? Let's put it into context here. If we look at the illustrations she includes of fat men in her book, these are obese men, unlike the women who are medium-sized. These men are depicted holding bottles, presumably alcohol bottles, and if we remember from her intro sources, we did find a quote from one of them about men harming themselves via tavern and table, being uncontrollable in their urges, and it becomes clearer why they were viewed this way and women were not. So then I asked myself, why would learned men consider fat men to be dull-minded? Well, probably because they were over-consuming alcohol, which would cloud their judgment and make them less coherent. Why would men gain this weight and women would not? It's almost like she forgot that any temperance movement that ever happened was led by women who were tired of their husbands being drunk all the time. Men were prone to over-consuming alcohol, thus gaining weight and getting gout. So in chapter two, Strings has managed to pinpoint the first signs of obesity and fat phobia, and it appears to be linked to white men judging white men. Let's see if she ever gets to her argument eventually that fat phobia is racist, because so far the only people that have been affected by fat phobia is fat white men. All in all, Strings' work so far has been pretty chaotic, with her sources that still don't quite make sense and a timeline that doesn't quite lay out right. I'm gonna withhold judgment on the final arguments of the book until I make it to the end, but I'll be honest, it is not looking great for her so far. It's almost like she purposely made this book difficult for the average person to read. Again, just switching random words out with words from like a thesaurus on her Microsoft Word program, like, I don't understand because then you have to take time to Google to make sure you're getting things uh, from her argument into context. It's almost like she didn't want people to read it and make it through on their first pass. And one of you pointed it out very well in the comment section of my last video when you said that a lot of these movements have one doctor, one book, something that is considered their Bible and they go by it, and nobody is allowed to question it, and a lot of times they themselves don't actually know what this book, this Bible, this thing they're looking up to actually says. 
So digging through this has been very challenging because it takes a lot of time to sort through her sources, her citations, where she's trying to go with her arguments and how she's lining it up because it's sort of all over the place. <laughs> But have no fear, we're going to continue struggling through and there will be another part as we cover part two, which is chapters three and four of the book. Um, and hopefully I will have that video out in a couple of weeks. Thank you so, so much for watching today. I would love to know in the comments if you're still enjoying this series or what you think about what I've found so far in chapters one and two. Do you have hope that she will successfully connect fat phobia and racism? Do you think it's possible given all of the things we've seen so far? Make sure to let me know down below. I will see you in the next one. Bye.